Welcome to the Everything Podcast, Season 2, Episode 97. So in the last episode, uh, I went through uh, Doctor Who Magazine, Issue 593, going through all of the 60th anniversary news. I'm going to do the same in this episode, but with Issue 594, we might get on to 595 as well. But we're going to start with, and this uh, issue has David Tennant on the cover uh, with his uh, Sonic, which I showed the video of release. I've shown it twice now, so I showed it... Uh, towards the start of the daily episodes era and then uh, in the last couple of episodes when I went through uh, all the 60th anniversary news but the first bit of news uh, is titled Tenant's Target all three of the forthcoming specials starring David Tennant as the 14th Doctor has become BBC Books Target novelizations early in the new year the trio of the titles are all based on scripts by showrunner Rusty Davis are the star beast by Gary Russell Wild Blue Yonder by Mark Morris and The Giggle by James Scott. Doctor Who script editor Scott Hancock tells Doctor Who magazine and someone who used to race down to the local library every Saturday to grab a handful of Doctor Who novelisations, many of which they'd read over and over again. It's an absolute privilege to keep the tradition alive for a brand new era. It's also a challenge. There's never any doubt we wanted to release novelisations of these new stories at some point. But releasing them around transmission raises all sorts of issues. The more we open our doors, the lot of last the more we risk leak, shall we wait, or can we keep these stories under lock and key until transmission? Teams of BBC Shoes and Penguins Random House have been incredible at answering our questions and talking through every eventuality, explaining their security processes, ensuring a minimum number of people are involved to protect our secrets. And the writers are not blabbed, not one of them, they all phoned me when they read the script because they had to talk to someone about it. Then we invited them to our edit suite just before Christmas to watch locked edits. Tears were shed of joy. I hastened to add now we're signing off the manuscripts now each is bold and different and joyous as the specials themselves pressure takes on familiar stories which is what target is all about the new novelizations will cost 9.99 each in payback and our schedules for publication on the 11th of january 2024 next up uh, is the letter from the showrunner who is rusty davis and this reads uh, during the final shoot for the new series rusty davis sees a familiar face Closing down season's end, the final hour, it's been a mad old shoot, busy and nuts and rare and wonderful. But now it's time to pause, I like to go out over all six studios, chuk chuk chuk, that great big noise that stadios, stadios, no, stage lights make on film when they're turned off. Do they really make that noise? I always ask for it on TV, I sit in the final mix and if the light goes out, I say, make it go chunk, it's a bedside lamp, chunk. Light system is still burning on just one set for the TARDIS and there's shooting Millie acting her hearts out. It's not the last scene of the episode. I don't think I've ever shot a last scene last or the first scene first. This one's in the middle bit of the finale. But exciting. Everything is at stake. Enemies are being fought. Fight, Doctor Ruby. Fight. I stand at the back of the studio. Millie catches my eye. We're over across the distance, but I don't step in. They're busy. Clock ticking. But around me, people are drawing in. Crew, office staff actors it's been a week goodbye jasmine and finney wrapped a few days ago big hugs see you soon but it all comes down to this the last scene it's kind of a tradition to go on set for the closing moments not a castle on tradition because sometimes last things in a field at 2am but if you can it's nice to come and acknowledge the moment plus this party tonight that helps there's dozens and dozens of people standing in the shadows off set but bathed in the glow of the monitors one more take jamie the director tells you to slide to the door to the floor even a little slow and maybe faster. I'm too far away to hear. And there's to my right, Bonnie Langford, the doctor's faithful companion now. Come to say goodbye. Did I say there's a party, a hug? Some days call a boy, some days call a beneath. Say I say, hello, Bonsai. Oh, I'm Bonsai, am I? Yes, like a tiny, beautiful shrub. Then we hush and watch the action. One more take, okay? And I look at Bonnie. 
and I think how uh, and I think how funny is this is to be standing here with her I consider the whole thing life careers choices and whispers I tell a story I've never told before many years ago I was cast as a play school presenter it didn't last to record one episode fuck family that I was on the wrong with the cameras and walked out of the tele of television set so no thanks back on the doll Roger Coffey one more year but when I recorded my one more year episode we rehearsed in the old North Acton rehearsal rooms famous to a Doctor Who fan as the site of the rehearsals for our favourite show I thought I won us a play school had a lunch break and I went to the canteen and sat down with my food and there they were Doctor Who I was in the same room as Doctor Who oh my god I could see them over there Sylvester McCoy and Bonnie Langford all smiles and energy and a lot of young actors all laughing and hooting and chatting a bright, br- uh, bright bunch of fun even from a distance I could tell that's fun over there. I didn't know that this was a rehearsal for Terrorized Towers and the young actors were red and blue cans. I only thought that's Doctor Who. That's actually real, genuine Doctor Who being made over there. And I'm over here. I'm in the wrong place. Oh, how I wish, how I wish we all my heart I could be on that side of the canteen. Then I went back to work on my one and only episodes and I took that memory away as a memory. Moments away as a memory. A once in a lifetime thing. But here I am with Bonnie on the tiles, and that's right. Whoop, clap, cheers, hugs, hooray. Lots of noise and full clones to make the other seats really I'm smiling. For 36 years, it took me 36 years to be on the set with Bonnie Longford's mouth and could brand new Doc 2. Go on, make a wish. The next announcement uh, to do with the 60th, kind of, or Series 40. Um, because, yeah, I think it should include because they have uh, little uh, things to do with the 60th, is to do with. Uh, the production diary, which is written by Scott Hancock, uh, Monday the 3rd of July. Production is always adapting and reacting to change. Jizz. Even the way through filming today, Geraint Harvard Jones, who is the first assistant director on Brock 5, issues a blue shooting schedule, updating the running order for the last two weeks. Tuesday the 4th of July, in the Bad Wolf meeting room, Russell and the script team meet with a writer for the next season who spent seven hours travelling to Cardiff. And discuss the first draft script. Meanwhile, on stage three, shooting Millie, film the sequence. The work technically featuring any of the Robert Block 5 ish episodes, and the amended yellow schedule is issued. Wednesday, the 5th of July, another writer meeting this morning, this time via Zoom, as one of our writers currently on the other side of the planet. Friday, the 7th of July, writer meetings continue as we catch up with another developing storyline. Sunday, the 9th of July, a, where, a rare Weekend shoot this time hidden away at World Studios aboard the TARDIS. Monday the 10th of July, our final week of filming kicks off with one last day on location, this time at a coffee shop in Barry before returning to Wolf Studios for a midnight wrap. In the production offices, the script team gather for a meeting for the next season, a second draft script for our first block of filming, followed by the first executive producer viewing of the season's block four episode from Shooters first season. We'll receive Draft one of our first block two episode for next season. Series 15 due for release in 2025. Tuesday the 11th of July. The team met with Albert, an environmental organisation that works with the TV and film industry to help production reduce their waste and carbon footprint. On that, the behind the scenes team conducted a tour of the studio with Bonnie Langford. Wednesday the 12th of July. A pink tile materialises near Tower Bridge in London, coincided with the Barbie premiere that evening. Friday the 14th of July is the final day of filming on shooting's first season, but things aren't slowing down because work continues apace on this next one, including an afternoon zoom with a writer temporarily out of this country, concluding with a crew photo outside stage 6 on wrap. And then, a short break in production follows for some, but not for everyone. Script speed is still coming in. Crew are getting booked and meeting to fill in the diaries. Three weeks until formal prep begins on the next season. Yes, so uh, the last... Um, bit of news uh, from issue 594 is the uh, it's not everything as I said in the last episode but it's uh, the 60th anniversary polls and in this uh, uh, issue it's the 12th and 13th doctors so the 12th doctor I'm going to do it like I did for the 10th and 11th in the last episode and go from what is cons- the least favourite episode and the favourite episode I was going to say best and worst but... so we've got in the forest of the night kill the moon Sleep No More, The Woman Who Lived, The Caretaker, The Eaters of Light, Robot of Sherwood, The Lie of the Land, The Girl Who Died, The Return of Dr. Mysterio, Into the Dalek, Empress of Mars, Knock Knock, Pyramid at the End of the World, Smile, Time Heist, Last Christmas, Hellbent, Deep Breath, Thin Ice, Twice Upon a Time, The Magician's Apprentice and The Witch is Familiar, Dark Water and Death in Heaven, Listen, Face the Raven, Extremist, The Husbands of River Song, Under the Lake and Before the Flood, Zygon Invasion, Zygon Invasion, The Pilot, Oxygen, Flatline, 
Mummy on the Orient Express, Heaven Sent, and the favourite Twelfth Doctor story is Wool Enough Time and Doctor's Falls. Now on to the 13th Doctor. Uh, so yes, same. Uh, so we've got Orphan 55 is uh, last. Then we've got the Battle of Ranskull, I have Colos, Legend of the Sea Devils, the Sarandra Conundrum, Arachnids in the UK, Praxius, the Ghost Monument, Can You Hear Me? Essential of Simon and the Times Children, Kablam, Revenge of the Revolution of the Daleks, It Takes You Away, Flux, uh, which is all of Series 13, The Witch Finders, Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror, Resolution, The Woman Who Fell to Earth, Eve of the Daleks, Spyfall, Demons of the Punjab, Rosa, Future of the Jadoon, The Haunting of the Lib, the Adati, and the favourite 13 Doctor story is The Power of the Doctor. So yes, uh, that's it for issue 594. Coming up next, I will be starting my announcements, or the announcements for the 60th, from issue 595. So yeah, as I just said, uh, we're going to be talking about Doctor Who magazine, issue 595, uh, which features Bonnie Langford on the cover, who will be reprising her role as Melanie Bush in series 14 of Modern Doctor 2. And we're starting off uh, with something to do with Yasmin Finney's character, so let's find out what that's got to do with the name of the rose to celebrate the birthday of Yasmin Finney on the 30th of August. The official Doc Two social media channels confirm that her character's full name in the series is Rose Noble. Rose is the daughter of Donna Noble, played by Catherine Tate, and Sean Temple, played by Carl Collins. We last saw Donna in the End of Time, which we broadcast on Christmas Day 2009 and New Year's Day 2010. The Doctor had to wipe her memory. Uh, so the question is what happens when Rose meets one of her mum's oldest friends it is a mystery for now but what we do know is that just like her mother Rose stumbles across something alien and from that point the seemingly ordinary family is never quite the same Rose Noble will debut in the Star Beast in November the first of three Doctor Who specials starring David Tennant as the 40th Doctor the next bit of news is the letter from the showrunner and the showrunner is Russell T Davis and this is uh, more centred around the specials because I think the other two have been more uh, concentrated at um, Series 14. So we'll see what that's going to say. At last, Rusty Davis gets to sit down and watch the finished version of the first of this year's Doctor Who specials, which we know is the Star Beast. Finally, the first week of August, I get a complete episode of Doctor Who. Yes, it takes this long. God, I'm tired of reading articles that say FX, uh, special effects. Um, these days are cheap and fast, they're expensive and endless, but here it is, the final version of St the Starbase, which you will see, faithful viewer, complete with all uh, special effects, music credits, and it's my job to ultimately sound this off a transmission. So I sit and watch it for what's probably, ooh, 50th time, and I sit and watch it as a producer. But that's what it's like to sit and watch it as a fan. Opening shot, oh my god, that's London, too much London, I like Sheffield, Sheffield snob, is this stock footage? How much does stock footage cost? Are you telling me the very first shot of New Doctor Who's from Stock is that wise wait, hold up, in the meta text, this is the shot that Russell RTD told us about in his letter from showrunner, the worm is eating the tail. Music, listen, music, Murray Gold, is it too loud, is it too quiet, is it any good, is it, oh my god, the TARDIS, the Jodie exterior, she's not been erased, and yet by not erasing it, are we erasing the argument she's been erased, everyone's not been erased, and other music change. It's going to be this, Mount Stone's that, I have no warning, what's that wind? Is that TARDIS wind on David's hair? Remember David's hair from the 50th? I love the 50th. How could this ever live up? When will we see the TARDIS interior? Wait, is the mu music... What is the music doing now even? I don't like it. Is that a Dudley Simpson motif? Or wait, this is Camden. There's also someone because fans stood in that spot and took photos in the airport. I've seen all those slightly but crucially different articles. I wish I'd been there. I will go next year. we back to Doctor experience, but it's still very reasonable for Sheffield. I will post about this and get reactions to the snub. Snub gate. I wonder if... It all these extra stuff to sign an NDA. How do I become... Well, NDA stands for non disclosure agreement, by the way. How do I become an extra? Wait, wait, the music just went up. Ah, is that Donna's theme? Is it... Are well, these the exact same calls that played at 43... Uh, the 40... Uh, 43, 17. So that's 43 minutes and 17 seconds in turn left, which is series 4, episode 11. I think so. I doubt myself. I know nothing. Sip of tea. Will the soundtrack be released? Or why can't they not release the novelization tonight? Is it any good on merely 7 so I hope... I hope Hope for Sean's uh, backstory. Will anyone ever go the extra mile, please? Oh, 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 the Doctor's coat. I like it. I don't like it. Will there be an interview about this coat? Oh, there's Catherine Tate. That thing was prestiging her. Wait, is this the scene? It was Ruth. Uh, where did I get up to? Prestiging her. Wait, is this the scene that was reconstructed online for fans to accept? I think certain lines have been cut. Will we ever see the missing lines? Will Doctor Who magazine print them? Why not? Censorship. 
Was it for this to play glue at all? Was the social group of the jaw to leave material on the DVD? If not, why not release the snap? Uh, I wonder if Doctor and Peter and Matt and Chris are watching. We were the 13th, 12th, 11th and 9th Doctors, respectively. But why? And why? Is it a problem for the villain turn out to be C Camilla from State of Decay who is hiding in her den? Do you see Cam Dan get it? Is this 4K? What is 4K? Will they upscale this to 5K and ruin it? Kafif. Will this uh, track be called on the soundtrack? A Cam Dan greeting. When will they release the season, season 10 soundtrack? And more importantly, what are the backstage secrets possibly murders that have kept Season 10 from us? Why, Murray? Why? Oh god, I wonder how many people are watching uh, Not Enough, Do Not Die, Doctor Who. It's time you died. Did they get paid extra for Nightshade? Wait, is it? Doctor remembers the uh, doc. If Donna remembers the Doctor, she will die. Sends text. But didn't she remember him the end of time? Received sex. No, she remembered aliens, not the Doctor. Nick Pick. Oh my god, but wait, look, view. We are faithful viewer, 30 seconds in. Good luck, Doctor Who Magazine. Several City Davis gave us a preview of the first 30 seconds of the Starbase, which we'll be seeing in a couple of weeks. And hopefully by the time you're seeing this, uh, the release dates uh, for uh, Doctor Who, uh, the Doctor Who 69 Wish Specials have been announced. It's about, it's, I think it's over two weeks now um, that I'm recording in advance, so I don't know. Uh, next up is uh, the production diary from Sean. Sean? No. Talk about Sean Collins. Uh, no, I merged the name there. Sean Temp. No, no. Anyway. Uh, Scott, no, yes, Scott Hancock's production diary, here we go. As work on se one season of Doctor Who wraps, it's business as usual at Wolf Studios as work continues on the series to follow. Script editor Scott Hancock fills us in on the details, Monday the 17th of July. Although filming only concluded for Shooty's first season last week, the production team returned to Wolf Studios for online reviews of specials 1 and 3, budget meetings for next season, special effects, uh, visual effects even, Reviews uh, sessions, and we welcome one of our in incoming co producers, Jess Gardner, who starts today, Thursday, the 20th of July. Drafts of brand new scripts are coming thick and fast, and today we receive a second draft of a script for Block 2. Through, though, even the shooting sequence may change in the coming months. Some episodes brought forward and others not back to take advantage of factors such as location availability, studio space, and more. Monday, the 24th of July, Alistair. Alison Sterling joins the team as one of our producers for Block 1 of the fourth coming season. Friday the 28th of July, casting director Andy, Andy Pryor meets with producers Chris May and Alison to discuss the latest thoughts for Block 1. Meanwhile, script editor David Schwing receives a second draft of the script currently allocated to Block 4. She said the 1st of August spread across various international locations. The executive producer group meet with producer Victor Darlow, director Jamie Donning you, I'm going with, and uh, editor Ben Jury to view the initial cut of their first block five episode for the first season, series 14. Wednesday, the 2nd of August, Angela Phillips joins the production office as the second season's line producer. While the producer group convened for a while, the producer even uh, while the producer group convened for a day of block one director meetings, Friday the 4th of August, one week on from delivery, Rusty Davis and David Train meet with our Block 4 writer at the Bud Wolf offices in London to discuss the latest draft. Monday the 7th of August, following last week's first cut review, the visual effects uh, team lead a special, uh, no they don't, they lead a uh, VFX, uh, visual effects um, spots for the episode sitting through scene by scene and marking up which shots require effects so co so costings and any subsequent edits can be made before the episode is locked. Our second new co-producer for the next second season, Sharon King, also begins today. Thursday the 10th of August, the locations team travel outside of Cardiff, accompanied by producer Alison Sterling and supervising art director Robin Paler, Haber, Robin Paler, to inspect a very specific form of transport. Monday the 14th of August, while the last four episodes have been kept up to who team busy with post production specials, edits and reviews of the first season, and early drafts and scripts for future episodes. There's a first first day of prep for block one of the following season. We also receive a first draft script for our second block two episode, the journey continuing. <sighs> and breathe. Yes, uh, so. Yeah, do Um. And the last uh, bit of uh, 60th anniversary adjacent type news is uh, from Doctor Magazine issue 595 is an interview with Emily Cook who's basically solely responsible for us getting the 60th anniversary specials. 
we explained in this interview titled The Butterfly Effect. It was during my meeting with Doctor Who's Supremo and showrunner that Rusty Davis suggested doing a piece on Doctor Who's star roving reporter Emily Cook stating firmly that without her, the forthcoming specials would not have happened, or at very least would have been completely different. Having just eased myself into the Doctor Who magazine hot seat, I was naturally reluctant to say no to anything Russell suggested, but to tell the truth, there was no hesitant on, hesitation on my part. What's great to do for a story that was so close to the heart of this magazine? There was just one small problem. Emily is modest to a fault and would sooner hurl her own trumpet at my head than blow into it. I soon e eased through reservations by telling her that if she refused permission to do this piece, Russ would sit on her head and tear her limb from limb. A, a liberty on my part, I confess, but it works. And Emily was released to speak to me, and it came to pass that on one Friday afternoon, we sat down and reminisced about how a simple Doctor Who lockdown tweets along planted the seeds for a brand new era of Doctor Who. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. For this story to make sense, we, we have to go back to the beginning. After catching up on how we've been since we last saw each other, so saw each other, uh, I asked Emily uh, where she first became a Doctor Who fan. When Doctor Who came back in 2005, I was only vaguely aware of the show. My parents had watched it and they were big Tom Baker, who's the fourth Doctor fans. I watched uh, The Ark in Space, uh, which was broadcast in 1975 on DVD and it terrified me. To me, back then, Doctor Who was just this scary old show that my parents used to watch. The idea of it coming back didn't fill me with much excitement, but me and my sister would gently forced to watch Doctor Who together as a family on the 26th of March 2005. I remember feeling annoyed as though we weren't going to be watching Anza Dex sat from that takeaway. Even so, I reluctantly sat down to watch Rose and it blew my socks off. I was hooked and, ins and inspired from the beginning. I'm so glad my parents made me watch it. Because that was the moment I fell in love with Doctor Who. I was a fan from then on and I never grown, I've never grown out of it. I then recall the first time I met Emily in the Panini offices Back, to, back when I was working on Doctor Who Batches, what led to involvement with Doctor Who magazine in the first place? I was studying English language and linguistics at the university, doing a module on language and the media, which included a project on magazine writing and journalism. Part of our coursework was to put together a magazine portfolio in every subject, that, of course. I, of course, did Doctor Who, Doctor Who inspired by Doctor Who magazine. I managed to arrange an interview with Louise Jameson, who is uh, a fourth companion, who is uh, a fourth Doctor companion, and um, plays Leela. Uh, by this point, I was totally getting the bug from the magazine, mag uh, magazine work. I'd always first time my last thought, maybe I won't do that. Maybe I'll do something different, something like journal. Oh, I missed a line. There we go. Let's just try that since again. So as you make it, I'd always planned on becoming a primary school teacher, but for the first time in my life, I started thinking, maybe I won't do that. Maybe I'll do something different, something like journalism. I want to explore that as an option, see if I'm any good at it. One of the, our other coursework tasks was to write a picture magazine at the time. I was, well, it was all hypothetical. I think I was supposed to send that, but I sent it to Doctor Who magazine editor Tom Silsbury. Uh, yeah, at the same time, I made contact with Doctor Who magazine through John Ellsworth, big Finnish producer, writer, and long-time contributor of Doctor Who magazine. It was very serendipitous. There we are. Thing I run a charity called Kushi Feet, which supports the education of street children in poverty. The easier words to say would be helpful, Doc 2 magazine, and we were the, uh, hosting this massive event, attempting to break the world record for the largest uh, Bollywood dance. I recruited a wonderful Bollywood performer called Ash Mahidra to lead the dance. And when we chatted, he mentioned that his partner, John Ames, will sometimes work for Dr. Magazine. I thought, that's incredible. What a chance. I, I mentioned that I would love to do some work experience. John helped me by putting in a good work with Tom. And they offered me a work experience placement, which was just before I started my masters in linguistics. I went along to uh, Trunbridge Wells for a couple, uh, yeah, for a couple of weeks. Uh, Louise James had kindly put me up because we've been kept in touch since I interviewed her. She was so supportive. She says I adore her. Anyway, I I did the work experience and had the best time. Yes, and that's actually where I'm going to end. So, yeah, uh, in the next episode, I'm going to pick up uh, the interview with Emily Cook from Doc 2 Magazine, issue 595. So stay tuned. But that is it for the Everything Podcast, season 2, episode 97. Goodbye. <laughs>